Ralph here once again. And before I begin, let me show you an interesting correlation. Now, this doesn't really say anything this early in the game. It's just an interesting trend which to follow. So what I'm doing here is I'm running vaccine uh, uh, comparisons in reference to uh, new cases and mortality. All right, then I come across right here, people fully vaccinated. And you'll notice this pair plot here in relation to mortality percentage. Now, for those not familiar, this is a, what's considered a correlation. So then I look at the numbers just to validate the graphing information, and we'll come back to this. This is just real, this is an observation. That's all it is. So we go back to about January 4th, around when vaccines started to get distributed. We have an interesting, really perplexing trend. All right, now this could do with time, season, the whole lineup, but still it's something to keep an eye out for. The mortality percentage for COVID-19, for example, prior to vaccination was about 1.79. And then as we go down the line here, as you follow this and the vaccines begin to kick up, you notice a higher mortality with this is right here is death smooth per million, this mortality percent, percentage. And this column right here is your cases smooth per million. Now watch this. As we go down here, you notice the deaths per million begin to increase. The cases per million begin to decrease. The mortality as a whole begins to correlate strongly with vaccinations. Now this right here, this right here is people fully vaccinated per 100. So you see the correlation. That doesn't mean anything. It could be other confounding factors. But however, though, it is so strong a relationship that all I'm saying it's worthy is nope. We'll come back then in a second. Let's get right into the vitamins in reference to, would you more importantly so, building individuals' defenses against this pandemic and potentially future pandemics. How vitamins, steroids, and potentially antivirals might affect SARS-CoV-2. Now, there's a real intriguing aspect to this. Now, this is going to uh, be redundant with a lot of information we covered before in reference to vitamin D and so on and so forth, and sometimes even the fatty acids. But let's look into their, uh, their answer right here. Uh, the simulations predicted that fat-soluble vitamins D, K, and A bind to the spike in the same way making the spice less able to infect cells and the spike protein. You hear about that with the vaccines all the time. And then there's a the hypothesis here goes obesity is a major risk factor for COVID-19, and we've known this for a long period of time. Vitamin D is fat soluble and tends to accumulate in fatty tissues. This can lower the amount of vitamin D available to obese individuals. Countries which uh, some of the vitamin deficiencies are more common have also suffered badly during the course of the pandemic. Earlier, we looked at the research and showed that vitamin D reduced the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 by about 51%. So we've had these tools available to us for quite some time, just on a bureaucratic level, for whatever reason. Um, and I believe it's because we're not pushing our bureaucrats hard enough uh, to actually look at research as opposed to what sounds good. I mean, they just do stuff, yes, but are they doing the right stuff? And I know it feels good to do stuff, but it feel a lot better to do the right stuff. So governments have been real reluctant to boost vitamin D levels in nursing homes, long term care facilities, hospitals, and so on and so forth. For whatever reason, I don't know. But still, just the same, I don't want to add uh, dimensions to this research beyond what it is. And so we go to the full study itself. And this is something which is fairly new to me as well. All right, so look at the full study here. And you see basically they looked at the docking library and the vitamin K, D, and K, which I mean the A and K, which we looked at before, A as well. And basically one interesting aspect I regret was not uh, elaborated in greater detail. And I hope the researchers, if they see this video, can basically chime in. But one thing that was really interesting as I scroll down here is this one line which I really would have liked to have seen more of right here. The fat soluble vitamin D, D3 metabolites, calcitriol, K and A ranked highly among, I believe, the ligand negative uh, by its binding energy. And it goes right here. This is something I did not know, which is also, we all should know. Vitamin K2 is the highest ranked compound overall. Now think about this. Vitamin D was 24th. Vitamin A, 13th. Vitamin A acetate, take that as 17th. K2, 
K1 70th. K2 is that much more powerful than D, A, and K1. And vitamin D reduced transmission levels down by about 51%. Then what the heck is the potential in reference to vitamin K2? And as you read through the entire research here, which is a great article in the hypothesis of what tends to bind these particular sites, it is wonderful little chart hidden at the bottom as you go through all the references, blah, 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 blah. And you see this wonderful little picture right here as the vitamin K, oops, the vitamin K2 and its docking potential. Is that a hint? Again, I'm not an ad publisher bias, but that is pretty, pretty profound. I regret this, uh, this, um, this diagram per se was not higher up, but if you go to the bottom of the research article, there it is. All right, next we're going to do some repeat, uh, actually confirmation of research that we've seen earlier. And this is important in reference to melatonin. Again, really good research. Melatonin produced in the lungs prevents infection by novel coronavirus. Now, the dimension which they found here, obviously the, the higher the melatonin in basically lungs, the better the survival likelihood. All right, but this is what this, I don't want to say obvious because it's wonderful, wonderful research. Please don't make it sound like I'm belittling it. Uh, it also, too, they found that it could possibly work in other respiratory viruses as well. Again, we are, we've pretty much blown it with this pandemic, all right, regarding uh, archaic medieval type uh, mitigation strategies. Unless, at least pick up the pieces and use what we have to fight any future pandemics far more efficiently. But let's look at this. You see, when they blocked the melatonin, basically, they found out that they had more problems. All right, big problems. But they also uh, speculated in conjecture, in addition to offers uh, the prospect of nasal administration in melatonin and drops or as a nasal spray to prevent disease from developing in pre-symptomatic patients. That's a wonderful, wonderful tool. And it's simple, effective, and eloquent. And the research is tending to basically jump on melatonin as well as other vitamins. And basically to find out with this one particular coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2, whatever it is, the strongest correlation is the health status of the individual by far. But even more so importantly, that is the nutrition status of the individual plays a huge role in the correlation of susceptibility to uh, this particular virus and possibly many others. And then let's we look here. We covered this information back in November uh, 10th, 2020. So basically what we're having here is a confirmation of the potential of uh, that particular treatment overall. And there's the data and the, um, you know, as far as the DUI citation of the prior research from November 10th to correlate with today's research on January 27, 2021. All right, now, next one. People with the omega threes. Now they speculate in regards to the cytokine storm inflation, uh, inflammation, and so on and so forth. This is an, also another powerful tool. Now, now this was a small study, so they want to use this as a pilot uh, to explore future uh, treatments or basically di diagnose an individual whether they be more prone to bad COVID or SARS-CoV-2 or whatever or not. And so let's look at it right here, and we look at quartiles. And so the people in the highest quartile, all right, the best omega-3 status. Jason, let me read the whole thing. The study included 100 patients admitted to the hospital of COVID-19 whose admission blood samples have been stored. So it's a small thing. And they were obtained and analyzed the omega-3 index, red blood cell membrane, EPA plus DHA levels at omega quant analytics. 14 of the patients died. How many of those patients do you think died in the higher omega-3 uh, quartile? The 100 patients were grouped into four quartiles according to the omega-3 index with 25% of the patients in each quartile. There was only one death in the top quartile compared to 13 deaths uh, out of 75 in the bottom quartile. So one death out of 25 in the top, 13 out of 75 in the bottom. So you have a strong correlation there in reference to the omega-3 levels. Now that could be a lot of confounding factors in regards to the quality of diet, so on and so forth. But still, it's a very powerful tool. Now let's combine it. A, D, K2, whatever that does as far as it's affecting this. 
melatonin. I mean, we can keep on adding things on zinc, quercetin, hepercetin, whatever we can keep on going. But you see, these are powerful tools that can help individuals take personal responsibility over their health as opposed to just relying on a facial covering. All right, now, let's go to the next one. Generally, what we're doing here, and this is another aspect, this is all the research came out January 27, 2021. This is not to scare anybody. Global analysis suggests COVID-19 is seasonal. Now, when we look at the data, where I'm about to just show you in our Python models, it's you're going to see this amazing correlation and drop in new cases across the globe almost. Really, really. And when you look at Sweden, remember, because Sweden's our control because they did virtually nothing, they began to go up, and then the mortality rates plummeted like a rock. But let's look at their information here, what he's recommending. What he did is basically said, hey, let's look at the whole aspect here. And what they came up with, basically, he goes, do, 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 right here. Says the researchers say our own immune system can be partially responsible for the pattern of seasonality. For example, our immune system response to flu can be influenced by temperature and nutritional status, including vitamin D, a crucial player in our immune defenses. With lower sun exposure during the winter, we don't make enough of that vitamin, but soon say how seasonality and immune system interact in the case of COVID-19. All right, so it's just reconfirmation, which a lot of researchers have been saying for a long period of time, that nutritional status can potentially play a role. Now, when COVID first came out, we heard all people saying, oh, you don't have an immune system to it, so on and so forth. Well, obviously that has been debunked. And since then, we found even ways to strengthen our immune system. And that's why the research is so cool. It's been coming out over the past few weeks. Let's go next. This one is interesting because this is my conspiracy side to it. Now check this out. All right. Findings may help close the door on COVID-19. Now, we look at this, we're looking at what's called an exon protein right there, NSP14. Now, the interesting part about it is just, just last week, this is January 27th, 2021. Just last week, we covered this from September, November 2012. Vanderbilt has a new live vaccine approach for SARS and novel coronaviruses, where they basically found out that SARS have mutates, they can, they can enhance the mutations and until it's, uh, for example, uh, to blow it out of the water. It's kind of like, uh, I guess, what you can call revving an engine at high speed when it's not, cap when it's not supposed to, it just burns itself out. In contrast, science fiction where mutations are evil and danger the world, our studies demonstrate the virus has evolved tightly controlled mutation rates, and changing that rate is detrimental to the virus survival and the disease in nature. So basically what they were doing is working on a virus, uh, not virus, a vaccine on the virus, which basically can accelerate the mutation rate to the point where it just self-destructs. And then, check out these names too, just to give you the project, Denison, MD. And that's an important one. There's also another important twist to this you're gonna find quite intriguing as well. All right, so we go back to the closing door and we know known about this basically, this weakness in the coronaviruses since 2012. Now, the interesting part about the incredible influence Vanderbilt University Medical Center has out on this is just profound. Because guess what else they helped develop? Only a few drugs are capable of circumventing the proofreader. They include an approved drug, remdesivir uh, and molnupiravir. Uh, molnupiravir. An investigation of drug now in clinical trials, both were developed with the help of Vandenberg University Medical Center. And of course, back in 2012, these people have been working on coronaviruses for a long time and the exact same names pop up. And it's so intriguing that this one particular uh, research institution, uh, remember you're reading, this is information you're reading from 2012. And uh, basically, They've had, they've known about this weakness for a long period of time, and there's that name, Denison. And uh, what they've done is they've taken that information, and it's almost like, who knows, kismet, whatever it is. But wow, I just want to give you an idea how powerful. Uh, there's Denison again, see, right there, talking basically so many years later, January 2021. They know so much about a virus. These people, I, I regrettably, in my uh, basically 
you know, opinion, should have been in charge of the pandemic mitigation strategy because they seem to know more about this virus way, 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 way in the past than anybody else I've ever seen. So much so that they're basically the major players in potentially developing uh, universal vaccines against potential coronaviruses per se, not the fact that against all, but maybe against most, uh, or, uh, or other. But isn't that an amazing coincidence so many years later and here we are today, and they're the ones major major manufacturers, probably the two most groundbreaking drugs used in this um, in this pandemic. And they've known this was going to happen for you know nine years, eight years. It's just give an idea. All right, now to reiterate, heparin, really really powerful thing. Again, this is like ah, people are going da da da. This is a drug, whatever it is. It really. It's an amazing, amazing impact. And what they discovered is they said, basically, we've known that heparin's inhibit a range of other viruses. So it's not just uh, this pandemic, but other future pandemics. Studying these drugs to provide new therapeutic strategies as possible first line of defense against emergent viral threats in the future, uh, especially when uh, wild vaccines are waiting to be developed. And basically, heparin interacts again. Just like the vitamins, sure, again, just like the vaccines, the spike protein, spike protein, spike protein. And just to basically reinforce the opinion of these researchers from basically the University of Liverpool, what did we cover basically back in July of 2020? Right there. Extracts from edible seedweed outperformed our Vanderbilt University Medical Center place. The current study of antiviral used to combat these heparin and common the blood thinner and heparin vi- uh, variants stripped of its anticoagulant properties performed on par with remdesivir remdesivir, inhibiting SARS-CoV-2 and the infection in mammalian cells. We've known about this stuff since July. And again, it's nice to see this information being reinforced, but still, I would have liked to have seen a, a bureaucracy seem to move so slow. Research is really, really, really fast. And there's a lot of incredible research. That's why we've been covering this every single week now on Saturday nights. But however, though, uh, just basically, it's just, it's just uh, bureaucracy as well known for what bureaucracy is, uh, is slow. This exciting news in heparin can be rapidly reversed to alleviate COVID-19 infections and possibly as a provoking like treatment to high-risk groups, such as medical workers, so on and so forth. So here you have melatonin now as possibly an spray, heparin, vitamin D, K2, uh, vitamin, uh, vitamin A variants, K1. And so we're going through the whole lineup there, and that's just this week. Uh, these are healthy recommendations that governments can utilize in order to basically mitigate a lot of the harmful effects of the pandemic and also allow the citizens to feel they have a little bit greater control than basically just having a face covering and staying away from people. But again, that's my humble opinion. So let's proceed forward. Also, too, as a side note, for those who want to know, I don't get a chance to cover everything, but here's one of my blogs uh or, or on the videos in reference to SARS, COV-2 and other things but for example like I this is a real fun one uh where they have COVID-19 personality types uh you know you have the uh for example what I call the exploiters who exploit the situation for power profit or brutality hmm interesting and again a lot of other uh, aspects of the personality types some I agree with some I disagree with but you know what it's actually kind of cool because it'll help in the future. But otherwise, let's get right into the data analysis. All right, here we go. We're going to start with this one. This we're looking at as far as, as running basically the uh, the heat maps. And this is a reference to people being fully vaccinated, as seen there, and the correlations. Now, this, here's the paradox. Now, look at this in the charts, which we cover uh, shortly. The people fully vaccinated... And basically, the new cases smooth tend to drop. Now, that could be, for example, you can't really give that credit to the vaccine because as you see, for example, new cases smooth per million, you see a little bit of rise right about here on January 13th. And then you see this really rapid, precipitous drop. But at the same time, mortality is increasing, which is really weird. Uh, And as well as the vaccine rates. This is correlation. It's not a causative argument, but it does. I don't have to say anything, but it makes you think just a little bit whether you're pro, anti, safe, or whatever. 
it's still numbers you need to keep track of because just something seems off. And again, this could be seasonal correlation, but the fact for the cases to go down, but the mortality to go up, again, they could be confounding factors in play, but I would still keep an eye on that. I'll just cover off this data analysis first. All right, this is what we're looking at right here. Uh, dang it. It's going, there it is. Do, 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 do. All right, this is important. So what we're going to have here in our date on the last thing right here is, if you look at the 29th, yeah, right there, so 29th. And so we're up to date. Let's look at Sweden. All right, right here. Sweden was basically on par, and this goes to January 16, 2021, to, the, uh, to about today. So look at Sweden. Sweden was just about on par with the United States. It was its death per million was skyrocketing, going pretty high. And remember, Sweden is our control because Sweden did virtually nothing. Uh, comparatively, Great Britain, you know, lockdowns galore, blah, 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 USA, same old, same old, same old. Uh, look how they most parallel each other and they almost have virtually the same pandemic mitigation strategy. Then look what happened to Sweden. What is that? Is that either a virus mutating to some sort of antigenic shift where it's becoming as the Exxon Pro team from Vanderbilt University Medical Center said before, the mutations are occurring more rapidly and therefore mutating itself out of any sort of uh, potential harm. Don't know. All right. And then we look at this. And here is our deaths in Sweden. Again. Here's your in numerical comparison, if you see it. You see how close? It was, it was right about on par with the United States, right there. And then, boom. And that's virtually doing nothing. Now, they said... Now, not a number thing, uh, that could be because sometimes they report every three days or so, but then also begin to drop. So look at this. Look at that. Now remember, I'm a number person. People go, do you believe in masks? Do you believe in distancing? Do you believe in this? And the thing about it is, is I don't get into the belief thing. I, I you know, we want to use primary Boolean logic and Boolean logic does, does this method work beyond a statistical, uh, margin of error in basically mitigating this virus, whatever it is. Complex. Does it work or not work? And that's what numbers are for. And uh, it's not about believing or not believing. Is Does it work or not work? And if you say someone says a surgical mask works in preventing SARS-CoV-2, I don't not believe them. I just want to see the numbers. And if the numbers validate it, it has nothing to do with belief. That was the worst thing that happened. We didn't turn this into a personality contest or a contest of wills and political ideology. And I hate to say it, most of the researchers out there, want, it, it, it ruins the research for them when you politicize research. They just want to research stuff. All right, here is Sweden. New deaths uh, basically in Sweden compared to the United States. <laughs> Look at that drop off. That's numbers. That's building and logic. And again, that's what we want to look at. Once you put personality or opinion into it or belief into it, the whole dynamic changes. All right. This is our information in reference to the United States versus all of the Asian continent. Here we are. Here are our countries. And these are new deaths. Now, look at this. Why? You have to ask yourself why. If you're a researcher, if you take all the nationality or whatever it is and you look at everything as cultures and societies as opposed to things between national borders – Look at it. Investigate. Something looks really, really wrong with this model. All right, we go total deaths per million. USA versus all of Asia. Uh, Armenia was pretty close to doing as poorly as the United States, then begin to drop down. And then we look at total mortality, USA versus all of Asia. Now, remember though, the yeah, I know it's apples to oranges. It's not the same because... Their total mortality for all of Asia was 314,590. This is not to do anything to mock or, beno or bemoan our situation in the United States. In order to know whether we're doing a good job or not, you have to look at, you have to look at others, whether it's other states, other countries, whatever it is. And if we had to compare ourselves with all of Asia, then something seems wrong and needs to be corrected. Asian population, 4 billion, 463 million. Uh, had 314,590 uh, uh, deaths. United States, 329 million approximately, had 436 million, sorry, 436,000, no, that sounds like Joe Biden, 436,799. And so just to be fair, that used to be George Bush as well. 
Uh, and so basically there's our population statistics. Uh, so generally what we're looking at as far as one person succumbing to COVID for 14,187 uh, compared to the United States, one person succumbing to COVID compared to 753. You're, you're an epidemiologist, you're a data analyst, you're uh, a bureaucrat in charge of a healthcare system. Do you just keep on ignoring what's happening in the rest of the world? Is it UVC lighting? Is it taking the shoes off they're coming in? Is it dietary, high levels of polyphenols from quercetin, uh, herpesitin, or, or high levels of positive bacteria from uh, fermented foods? You, op you have to look at it because the mass, the distancing, and the lockdowns, obviously, all, all correlated with many of the Asian countries, there's got to be more to it. All right, so here we go. And this is basically new deaths smooth per million, people fully vaccinated. This is where our data comes in a little weird. All right, this is when our vaccine started kicking in right there. And look what happened here. The new case is smooth. You see how it began to drop already? Now, I know what's going to be happening. A lot of people want to say, oh, it's the vaccines doing this. Well, again, who kn I'm not going to correlate numerical possibility or probability. We just know the the probability of vaccines having any relationship to doing this is quite probably low. But however, though, the probability of them take the vaccine proponents, I'm not going to say proponents per se, uh, taking credit for the drop in new cases, probability is going to be kind of high. Statistically, could there be a relationship? On the low end. But on the same time, too, and here we go. Here's our graph as far as Mortality percentage, you can't see here. New cases smooth, da da da, poly full vaccinated. Here's a date. Short chart starting from January 4th, 2021. All right, and here we go. Now, here we go. This is the whole time. So, this is going all the way back to January of last year, 2020. People fully vaccinated, 0.99. All right, so I, I doubted the figures. I wanted to see there's something that was really wrong with that. All right, and there's a mortality percentage. Here's our other mortality percentage. See, new death smooth per million went down. So you have to look at the whole. So you have this perplexing number. I'm not saying it's clean. I'm just saying it's odd. All right. And so here we go. Because you remember, the, as you have less cases and you could, you see the difference here, you could have a higher mortality percentage, even with less cases, more, you know, more people succumb to it severely, so to say. And there we go. And this is our more death, new death smooth per million, mortality percentage, obviously, people fully vaccinated to new cases smooth per million, and then people, uh, see, here we go, boom, boom, that's a 0.99. All right, so here's our basic paraplot. You can look at the chart here, the do, but numerically, this is going to stand out a lot more as we basically close this one particular window. All right, you see here, again, percentage of the population vaccinated is on a global scale. This is for mortality per million people, global scale. This is the cases per million, I believe. Yep, on a global scale. And this is the mortality percentage. You can easily work these numbers out on a global scale. So all we have here is circumstantial and doesn't mean anything yet unless we see this trend begin to continue. But as the percentage of the population increases in its vaccine uh, proportions, this number has been going up and down a little bit. This number, though, has been consistently going up. That's the percentage of mortality. As the number of new cases has been declining. Just something to keep an, uh, an eye on in the future. Not saying much right now because it's too, too early in the game, but still, that's something to keep an eye on. All right, Untitled 3, this is just for information as I work on the new charts. COVID positive case trend each day. If you want to look at it from that aspect, back from March, and there we go. Now, what I draw my attention to this one particular chart is this. There is, for whatever reason, on a cyclical level, you see right there, you have this bump. Right about before the election, you have this bump. And every once in a while, you get this trend line. And where it's just basically going, you know, pretty much on an easy, predictable route. Back here, you could have thought the pandemic was basically over globally because it wasn't really going anywhere. Then all of a sudden, boom, 
boom, and boom. So what gets my attention? These sharp changes in angles. And that's something to keep an eye out to. And this is a case of trend, a positive case trend total. So here we have, again, looking at 25 million and positive cases, whatever it comes out to be as a percentage of the population. All right, let's go to the next one. The world data, we just get the correlations again, looking at. Uh, just going to run through this real fast. Let's see if we have anything new that's interesting that basically pops out. All right, here's our world. Let's look at this data first. This is the heat map. As far as the correlations are concerned, it's really weird. Uh, there's not necessarily a lot of correlation still. Stringency index, uh, the only thing I can really say is strong correlation with, ironically, is median age and life expectancy. As far as the stringency index on a global scale, uh, looking at total deaths per million, you have maybe the inklings of some relationship, but not enough to be a 0.7, like right there. We can start saying you have a correlation. And uh, some things are very low, uh, per se, uh, like the 0.37. You're looking right there. So new death smoothed is really not heavily correlated with having a, a tighter stringency index compared to the rest of the world. Again, there could be confounding factors like reporting and so on and so forth. But let's continue down the line. We've seen this information, this information, this information. Here's the United States. These are all the countries now doing better on deaths per million uh, as opposed to us. So you have countries, for example, which really surprised me. Australia. I mean, because you wouldn't expect China, Thailand. Uh, I'm looking for a place with high on the human uh, development index, which a lot of these are here. So you, you can basically say the trusting is their reporting is fairly uh, decent. Now, check this out. India. Deaths per million. Even though India has a lot of cases comparatively to our population, interesting. And so we're about 9.47 deaths per million. When we first started this, we're at 3.6. And so, and that's with all the pandemic mitigation strategies we've been implementing so far. And you tell me, I mean, how do you determine whether uh, pandemic mitigation strategy is working if you have no control? And that's why we do these data analytics so we can look at other parts of the world. Our world masks, facial coverings. All right, we just up to date. That's 17th. Uh, here's there. So we're up to date on the January 29th as far as mass levels. So let's look at it over here. Let's see if we see any change anywhere. Uh, world masks uh, or facial coverings. Are there any relationships between deaths per million? No correlations popped up yet. Hospital patients per million facial coverings. Uh, that's visible. If you see any, go for it. Hospital patients per million, deaths per million. All right, that makes sense. Do deaths per million, hospital patients per million. Those are correlations, but facial coverings. Do you see any 0.7s there besides facial covering to facial covering? Again, something to look at from a math, uh, numerical standpoint. Obviously, these are the confounding factors. But if I had to just pick it apart, I'd say there has to be something else accompanying it because nothing seems to be making a difference. Although the whole world seems to have be doing it. Even Sweden went to a one. So Nicaragua, Vanuatu, Vanuatu are holdouts. But again, Japan's a one just along with Sweden. And look where Sweden is as far as dropping on the mortality scale and infection scale. All right, let's look at our countries real fast. I'm just going to boom, boom, boom. And here's Sweden. So again, I want to use this to highlight because it's our control. And look at this drop. And that is basically uh, cases per million. And then we go here again. Look at this. Test per thousand. That must be some reporting error. Cases per million. Look how fast it's dropped. And that's going to correlate with other parts of the world where there's been, there's Japan. Well, except, except there it is. And where there's been a drop consistently across the board. And let's see if there's anybody else here. India, intriguing, almost no deaths per million as it's dropping down pretty darn far. Uh, it's intriguing. Spain is an exception. I don't know what's happened with Spain. Remember in 2019, they found uh, February 2019, they found SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater in Barcelona. Uh, France, pretty much the same thing. United Kingdom went off the chart, came back down. 
Italy, Italy, Italy. What's the test per thousand? Testing is going up. Cases per million are going down. My voice sounds positive because look at the data at hand. It is. But however, though, let's look at the states. Again, we're going to use Florida as our control. Here we go. Looking at our controls, do, 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 mortality increase. Florida, California, looks pretty much the same levels. Pause per 100,000, pretty close. Remember, Florida basically was supposed to fall off the edge of the earth. But the one thing you could say between these three, even from this chart right here, is that it doesn't seem to make a difference. Lockdown, no lockdown, facial coverings being mandated or not. Again, the feeling about doing something sometimes feels right, but there is collateral damage to what we're doing. But look at it just the same. Can you tell me if there's any difference? Seriously? That's what you need to control in order to remove biases. Doesn't mean there can't be any other confounding. But however, though, uh, New York and California should be saying they're doing a lot better than Florida, and Florida's not doing much of anything. Nah. Now comes some of the interesting aspects of a greater in favor of Florida itself. Deaths per 100,000. Florida, orange, Florida. Again, thinking Boolean, just true or false. Is Florida with doing virtually no lockdowns right now doing better than Florida or California? Has it been doing about the same as New York or any other state the entire time with or without lockdowns? California. Well, that's California. All right, let's keep on going. Death increases per 100,000. Florida is blue. Florida. California is green. All right, positive increases per 100,000. Again, Florida just a little bit above there, but it's not seeming to translate to mortality. Hospitalizations per 100,000. Florida is blue. Blue. California and orange, New York. There is your basically the information before the court. You make a decision. Uh, basically, California, Texas, New York, and Florida. So most of them are the mortality. The positive increases per state. This is numerical, not as a per million base. And it's an interesting dynamic. There's California. All right, here we go. And let's go to the next one. Population, hospital occupancy rates. This is a biggie. All right, so here we go. We're just going to look at the, a few of the, a few of the states. We're going to get past these numbers here. Well, is there anything here? All right, this inpatient use, remember this red line is in the 2%. It's about the normal occupancy rate of the IC beds overall. So you can see California is pretty high up there if you want to look at those numbers real fast. Patients in bed with COVID, about the same, it uh, seems like. Now let's go down to the line charts, a little easier. California. Inpatient beds, inpatient beds used, inpatient beds used for COVID. Follow the trend. Let's see. New York, inpatient, this is we're looking at the entire state. So we're not looking at basically cities which could be overwhelmed. Inpatient beds, inpatient beds used, inpatient beds used for COVID. You're seeing a nice, very small, subtle slope downward. Again, here's Florida. Not going to see much of a difference between that and any other state that does lockdown measures, but something to keep an eye out for. This is your ICU bed utilizations between each state. And for example, 89% for California, da 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 da, and so on and so forth. All right, so I think that one's that chart. Let's go to the next one. Uh, this is where we begin to work on the vaccinations. Now, there's an interesting dynamic here between the vaccinations and anything else to notice. We use the exact same data from the CDC as a lot of the other reporting uh, elements. In fact, our data, our data, our data is myself, me, myself, and I. All right, so December 14th, we started collecting the second dose shipments of basically the data. And so what we do is, what I'm doing, I should say, is we're totaling all the second dose shipments of Monero and basically the Pfizer vaccine itself. So what I'm doing is I'm pulling them all together and that's giving me the total. And so as we go down, for example, here and so on and so forth, you can see the numbers. And this is the total allocation of the Pfizer one and Moderna, Moderna, Monera. Uh, it's basically, here's our population. These are the total vaccine distributions of each group. 
And these are the second dose basically we're looking at. So what we're doing is we're trying to use conjecture and say that the second dose usually correlates strongly with being fully vaccinated. When I first came up with this chart, I thought basically what would end up happening, happening is, is we would have people vaccinated the second the vaccines came in. Uh, but however, though, if I run the numbers the way they're supposed to, the population, the current total of percent vaccinated, this is what it should be if each one of those second doses of Moderna and the Pfizer's vaccine were allocated with 100% efficiency to the individuals. So Alaska, for example, would have about 23.83% of its population fully vaccinated. So in each state, what we have here is the total amount of vaccines where if they were distributed should be. Obviously, that's not equating to that. So I'm a little perplexed in reference to why it's not. Uh, whether vaccines are being left in warehouses, being just sitting around or whatever it is, but it should be there. And what we have here is a patient in bed utilization. You see what we're looking at here. So I'm trying to find the figures. This is January 25th. And so we run through the numbers, hospital to vaccine comparison. These are the vaccine levels. And yeah, they're pretty similar. Again, New York, I don't know why it's still so low in the, the, uh, the distribution, uh, even in the administration route. But here's your patient in bed utilization, your patients in ICU, and your vaccine levels. So again, it's not a lot of states uh, are really having massive ICU bed problems, except maybe, again, Alabama, California, and Georgia. Everyone else seems to be on the lower end. But however, though, there's the vaccine levels. And so to reiterate and repeat, Here's the numerical information for you to see as follows. And this, of course, is just a redundancy of the information we saw earlier. Population, total allocation, the Pfizer second dose, total allocation of the Moderna, and the percentage of the people that should be vaccinated if those vaccines, very simple math, were fully distributed with uh, efficiency. There is our vaccine delivery scale. For whatever reason, uh, the best shipment we ever had was on December 21st. And then you can see almost begins to bell curve out over time, bell curve, developing some sort of a field of normal, normal, normalcy uh, across the board. But there we go again, looking down, and that's the information we have at hand. So we covered about eight, basically everything I did, COVID state testing. Let's see real fast. Uh, looking real fast. And we'll look at our correlation. Yep, again, as usual, our correlation is 0.9. 98% correlation between total tests and mortality. Look at this real fast. As far as positive increase in mortality, look at this chart right there as far as the drop. I wanted to show you that too. That started happening, bouncing back and forth right around January. And look at that precipitous drop from about the 40,000 range to positive increase. So the increase, what I'm saying is the increase went down from about 40,000 per day to about 20,000. That is amazing. Here's your mortality differences. Red is mortality. Purple is your positive increases. You see that? The mortality begin to increase as the positive cases begin to uh, increase, begins to decline. Again, it's, and this is right around mid-January. It's interesting. That's all I want to say. I don't want to publish a bias to it. Uh, keep on going down the list here. Correlation. This is total test results to mortality. Again, numerically by coincidence over this period of time. I don't know. There's your X and Y graph. There's your slope. Let's go to da da Going down. Let's look at any further charts. All right. There's our the states with the highest correlation uh, to total test results to mortality. I'm talking not total positive test results. I'm talking total test results, including the negative. And again, if anybody has an explanation for that, I'd be more than happy to hear it. Look at that. How do you have almost perfect correlation between total test results and mortality? That is bizarre. And we go down the list, 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 list. There's our heat maps. If you want to see real fast, positive tests to, posit uh, to percent positive, so on and so forth. Here's your... 
Interesting, isn't it? And total test results, so on and so forth. Uh, to mortality. Again, we go down the list. North Carolina, North Carolina. I want to see Florida refresh. Here's your mort mortality percentage. You see it's going up. All right, this is that North Carolina again, Virginia. I want to look at the mortality percentage. Bouncing back up. Even though the caseloads are going down. Georgia. Now, what is that? Again, you see the, positive, the death increase is, is increasing across the board. It's correlated with many different states and geographies. Mortality percentage going up. Positive cases going down. Mortality percentage is going up. That's unusual. Uh, and uh, da, 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 there's that. And there's our heat map, California. Positive uh, mortality going up as positive increases declining. Look, look at this. Mortality percentage per positive. See, that's what's that's what I'm finding so intriguing. Now, it just correlates the time the vaccine started coming out, and it could be seasonal. It could be a lot. It could be, you know, maybe you know, not to add conjecture, but if SARS-CoV-2 is becoming more like SARS-CoV-1, which had a very very low transmissibility. Uh, well, not low, you know, lower than normal, uh, but if it had a very high mortality rate. Remember, SARS-CoV-1 had a mortality rate of about 50%. SARS-CoV-2 has a mortality rate way, 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 way lower. But, and, but however, though, this trend across the board, as the transmission rate is going down, but the mortality is increasing, again, needs to be taken note of. Uh, there's our, our basic heat map for California. Let's look at New York. A little bit of an increase there. Uh, what's this, Florida? A little bit of an increase there, a little bit of drop there. And then, yeah, let's run down this. And I'll keep, keep an eye on uh, in the future in reference to basically you know, the uh, positive increase to mortality, positive increase decline I mean, less people testing positive on a daily basis, but a higher mortality. Again, it could be done after the holidays, so on and so forth. There could be a lot of psychological reasons for it, just the same. But it's pretty uniform uh, regardless of the geography. So let's see what we covered today, just to recap. And it's about a 50-minute period of time real fast. And so basically, we'll go backwards to do personality types of the COVID personality types. You know, I'm a little bit of a mix of all of them. Uh, we recovered basically. Look at this. I'm looking. I'm trying to get my point across. Uh, the seaweed extracts, heparin, as far as being very beneficial in reference to that spike protein again, and that information was reiterated or it's reinforced again. It's January 28th, 2021. Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt from 2012. Incredible, incredible fortuitous research, long, long time ago, in reference to developing uh, vaccines for SARS. Uh, also, to have to be a major player in helping develop a few of the most groundbreaking drugs for SARS-CoV-2 about eight years later. All right, so global analysis suggests that basically it's coming seasonal. And the main reason we brought this up is because vitamin D may play a role like it doesn't have flu season. And that's publisher bias. I'm adding to the researcher's research. But again, it, I mean, seriously, why not? All right, research shows people with a uh, high omega-3 index less likely to die from COVID. Can be confounding factors in there, but, you know, I've taken a little bit of fish oil here and there, which he recommends in the full study. Uh, it's beneficial, not just not just beneficial in prevention of, of, uh, of succumbing to SARS-CoV-2, but beneficial as a health reason overall. Joints, skin, hair, nails, uh, mental acuity, so on and so forth. So why not? All right. Then we look again. We identified melatonin as a possible COVID nineteen treatment back from November tenth, twenty twenty, and then that information was reinforced just recently with a very innovative way. This January twenty seventh, twenty twenty one, twenty twenty one, twenty twenty one, basically using melatonin in drops or spray to prevent the disease from developing in pre symptomatic patients. Innovation. That is the science I like to see, and there's been so much of it and so little in the news all right then another wonderful one which kind of like the mystery it's like it's like hey guys vitamin k2 worked better than everything 
and then period. That's the end of it's like it's like watching a trailer to a movie that never never premieres. And so vitamin K two looks very very interesting, very cryptic way of adding the documentation. But a vitamin K two obviously is back up this way is one of the best out of everything out there as far as uh, helping uh, basically dock to that um, a high ranking compound, uh, the highest rank compound overall in reference to helping with the information in reference to the docking. The docking, it sounds like the Soyuz space program. But otherwise, yeah, so basically vitamin K2 shows an incredible amount of promise I'd love to see some clinical trials reference to it now. If that is the highest rank compound overall, and we're fascinated with vitamin D, seriously, they got to be more research in the future. And again, the links will be there for you to follow as well. Gratitude. Thank you. Keep in mind, this is recorded in 4K. So we're probably looking at about a week before it's finished processing on YouTube. But sometimes it goes faster, sometimes not so much. Gratitude, thank you. Hope to see you all again on Tuesday. Uh, the links will be there so you to follow to the research. So you don't have to take my word for it. You could actually delve into it yourself and say, hey, you found it. Otherwise, how the information gets out there, there's no consequence to me. I just want my gym to open back up. All right, Ralph signing off. Catch you in a bit. Bye.